So we're gonna talk about lending. I'm telling you, I'm so passionate about lending and money and notes and capital and funds, all of those great words, because it's what you need to do this business, right? Everything revolves around your finances. So one of the things that you need to understand is that there is so much money out there, so much money out there, that should never be the problem. That should never be an excuse for you not to do this business. It should never be an excuse, and I'm gonna show you why today. So. I am with a company called Carolina Capital Management, actually. Carolina Hard Money is how we do our business. We do raise money for funds, but we also put it out on the street. I am not here to raise money for funds today, so that's my disclaimer. Anything you learn today is purely informational. So all of those other disclaimers that you saw, just think of those when you're listening to me. Okay. <laughs> So I've been lending money since 2001. I started when I was 12. <laughs> I started out as a recovering mortgage broker. Anybody in here a recovering mortgage broker? You know what that is? Somebody who gave it up. So in, in 2001, I was in business with somebody by the name of Larry Goins. You may have heard of him. Um, he's, 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 he's pretty much an investor. <laughs> he and I had a mortgage company together and we did conventional loans. We did any kind of investor con conventional loan. So when 2008 rolled around, we were only doing conventional investor loans. Guess what happened to us? Uh, nothing. <laughs> like there was nothing left. There was no, we couldn't buy a loan. I remember on, it was a Friday afternoon, we had just closed about 18 loans on the day before, Thursday. And then on Friday afternoon, we had another 20 loans that had been closed. That's, that's how much business we were doing. And on Friday afternoon, our lender that we were sending all those loans to called me and said, oh, I'm so sorry, but we can't fund any of those deals we've done over the past two days. Um, things had changed a little bit. Um, I saw Jeff ask everybody who's been around a while, who's been through that crash, and I'm telling you, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because now I'm about as cautious as they come. I'm not gonna let it happen again. And you need to remember, it's important that we remember history. History is getting thrown out the window, mm -hmm. whether it's 200 years ago, 50 years ago, or five years ago. History repeats itself. Keep that in mind. You've got to remember what happened so you don't get caught up the next time it comes around. I got a lot of people going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm in business with my brother, Bill. Uh, many of you know him. He's a great guy. His job is to raise the funds. My job is to put it out on the street. We lend all over the Southeast. Um, we do commercial loans, we do uh, single family, we do fix and flip, we do self storage, all kinds of stuff. But what we really like to do is educate people and make sure that they're successful in what they do. Jeff had said earlier too that he knows that, he's heard me say that we turn people down for loans every day. And I hate to do it, but my goal is to get to a point where I don't have to turn them down anymore. And that should be all of our goals. We should be operating from a sense of abundancy and not scarcity. There's enough deal and enough love to go around for everybody. So I am not only in the, in the hard money industry, but my side gig is short-term rentals. I love doing short-term rentals. It is so much fun. And, and we're getting kind of fancy. I'm now looking into communal housing. I'll let you know how that goes once I've got it up and running. <laughs> and. Um, we are also looking at doing some funky stuff, you know, uh, being, uh, listening to, to Lisa talk and listening to Mike talk about the shipping containers and things like that. It's so exciting. I can't wait to give it a shot. I do have a tiny house in my yard as well. So in the Airbnb business, the short-term rental business, I have, how many do I have up there? 14. I'm actually now, I just added four. Let's see, within three miles of my office. So 
eight and with eight were in th within three miles of my office. I just added four more. So what's really cool is that I can be at three or four properties in about 10 minutes and be back at the office. It's really cool to be able to do that. I don't want to have to do that, but sometimes I do. Uh, the other day I had to roll up a trash can. That was fun. Um, but anyway, the point is my office is located in a little town called Rock Hill, South Carolina. Anybody been there? Yeah. Oh, wow. So you drove by it on the interstate, didn't you? <laughs> so we're a bedroom community of Charlotte, North Carolina. So, you know, like everybody's been saying, it's about 30 minutes to get into town. COVID was a great thing for us. It, we were booked when it happened. People canceled for about three weeks, and then we were slammed again because of who we attract in our town. So it was a great thing for us because we had people that were coming in doing construction work on highways, on power plants, football fields for the high schools. We, we were just slammed. And as soon as that stuff started kind of wearing down, now all the vacationers were coming back, family reunions, <laughs> weddings, all of that stuff we've talked about. I also have one in Florida and one in the foothills of North Carolina. So we talk about who the heck comes to your town. There's always reasons why people are coming and staying in Airbnbs. This isn't an Airbnb talk, but we have so much so many people here that are talking about doing this short-term housing that I want you to understand that anybody can do it wherever you're located. You, you just need to open up your mind about it a little bit. So the thing about whether it's short-term financing or a fix and flip, there's a multitude of ways that you can finance your properties. And you need to open up your mind. Everybody thinks banks, everybody thinks hard money lenders. That's just a little tip of the iceberg. There's so many opportunities for you to hook up with some money and we're gonna talk about all of that. So you see the conventional lending, um, creating a note. I know a lot of people here create notes. Um, the new thing that I really like is the non-qualifying lender. Anybody here of non-qualifying lenders? Anybody? Really? Oh, yay! I get to really share something new, new with you, and it's the, it's the fastest growing segment of the lending market right now. And you're going to get to a point, so you know what it is, <laughs> you're going to get to a point where you won't even think bank at all because the non-qualifying lender companies are actually offering such a better deal for you. Private money lenders, subject to hard money, seller financing. So remember the private money lenders, Steve, and I'm not gonna try to say his last name, with Quest, talked about how much money Quest has that's not placed or not invested. Do you, anybody remember that amount that he said? Four hundred million dollars. That's a lot of money. Did you say billion? Okay, you know, because I was going to say that's scary, but it is. It's four four hundred million dollars. That's a lot of people that have money that haven't invested it. And you know why they haven't done it? They don't know how to do it. They don't know where to place it. They don't know who they can trust. They're, they've got this money in a self-directed, I have money in a self-directed IRA that I don't have invested and I loan that money out every day. What's wrong with me? There's always an excuse to not do it, but I can tell you this, if you get on Quest Trust IRA, if you get on their website, they have an, event, an events page. They do a, a happy hour, um, do they do it monthly or is it weekly that they're doing it? Anybody doing it? It's bi-weekly. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's on Zoom, so everybody can't go to Houston. But if you go into that room, that Zoom room, and you attend that meeting, it's like you're there. And you're gonna get an opportunity to meet all of these people who, are in, who have their money sitting at Quest. $400 million worth of people are sitting in front of you. Would that be a good opportunity for you to meet some people to be able to borrow some money from? Absolutely, that's a great networking and that's just one start. You need to t attend those events. It's really, really good stuff. They also have some great training. If you understand how to do self-directed loans, if you understand what you can and cannot do when you're lending self-directed IRA money or borrowing it, 
you're, you need to learn everything you can because your goal is to teach the people that have the money that don't know how. And you really need to understand what you're doing because you want to protect their money. Do you want to just do one loan with them? Or do you want to do several loans with them? Protect the money that's being given to you better than you would on your own. Okay, today we're going to have three, three things that I really want to make sure that you guys walk away with. <clears throat> and that's the types of properties that lenders like, because there is one. Um, the multitude of options for financing, of course, and what it will take for you to qualify. That's really what I'm trying to make sure that you walk away with today. So, <coughs> maximum cash flow, we're going to talk about due diligence, Ma maximum cash flow, long-term communal rents, student housing, international rentals. Have you done any student housing for international students? Did you know that's out there? Do you know they pay a lot of money? That's really good stuff. Um, 30, 60, 90 day people who are renting your properties. So a lot of people think, oh, I don't want to really do Airbnb or short term stuff because there's a lot of turnover and you have, to, and maybe my neighborhood won't allow it or maybe your city won't allow it. But if you have a 30 day minimum, your city changes their mind on that being a short term property. Did you know that? makes a big difference on what you can and cannot do. When you list properties on any of these platforms like Airbnb or VRBO or any of these other platforms that are out there, you can actually put a minimum up there. I learned this from Al Williamson, who is like Mr. Airbnb of all time. <clears throat> I, he, he puts a 30-day minimum. He, he, when he told me this, I thought, gosh, why would you want to do that? You're cutting out all the people that want to look at your properties. Yeah, you are. You're only attracting the people that are coming to stay for 30 days. Isn't that what we're trying to do? Is attract those people that are only gonna stay for 30 days. And he, he's just, he's, he's really rock and rolling with that. Okay, locations are important. Um, Jim talked about the traveling nurses and that they like to stay 30, 60, 90 days. I've had some stay longer than that. I've had some stay shorter than that. But being close to those those um, facilities really, really make a difference in what you're buying. And somebody else said yesterday, and I think it might have been you, talking about <clears throat> making sure if, you're, if a female can get out of the car and unpack her luggage and feel safe, that's a good place to be buying. Or if a female can walk down the street at 10 o'clock at night and not feel worried about where she's going, that's a good place to buy. So you gotta be careful about that. Zoning is so very important in what you're buying and what you want to do with it. Everybody has these really cool ideas about um, the shipping containers, the tree houses, the yurts, uh, glamping, like they're doing whole neighborhoods now or a, a, a whole campsite that's all tents. That's what I want to do on my farm. I live way out in the middle of nowhere on 15 acres and I want to do tents. And as I was getting started, I called the city to make sure I could do that, or the county actually, to make sure that I could do that, and guess what? They said no. They can tell me on my 15 acres that I can't have uh, campers? Huh, but they can. So that kind of killed my idea on that. But when you're buying property like that, do your due diligence, on, no matter what you wanna do. If you wanna take a single family home and turn it into a duplex, make sure you're doing all of that due diligence. The more due diligence you do and the better prepared you are, when you come to somebody to borrow money from, the more likely they are to lend the money to you. <clears throat> HOAs, who lives in an HOA neighborhood? I pity the fool. <laughs> so difficult. Uh, gosh, they tell you you can't park your camper or you can't have a doghouse in your driveway. Oh, yeah. We're <clears throat> you're moving. <laughs> it's really, really tough. But understand that when you're doing any kind of fix and flip property, a uh, buy and hold property, understand that the HOA can determine everything. Some of them are really, really strict with paint colors and all kinds of stuff. And I'm telling you, it can totally change what you're doing. It can, it can put a huge block on the rehab that you're working on. 
and, and completely change your numbers on what you're having to put into the property. So make sure you read those covenants and restrictions, please, before you close, because it can change everything for you. Um, neighbors are always interesting, I think. Um, <clears throat> like if I'm gonna do an Airbnb neighborhood, or an Airbnb house in a neighborhood, I always take pizza coupons to the neighbors and introduce myself and tell them how excited I am to have them as a neighbor and that here's a pizza coupon, if you, and here's my, here's my information. If there's any issue going on over here, I wanna know about it. And I've got a watchdog, a good watchdog. Very, very important to understand your neighbors. <clears throat> These are the words that I really hate to see termites, moisture, rot. Are these things that we know about before we buy a house? Not all the time. Not all the time. But do what you can, whether you're lending or whether you're borrowing, do what you can to make sure you're inspecting these areas. I can't tell you how many scopes of work that have been delivered to us from people that are buying houses that the contractor never went under the house or in the attic. Never. You know where my biggest costs always are if I'm re re uh, rehabbing a house? It hits me underneath that house. When I buy in a neighborhood, <clears throat> here's one of the reasons why I really like buying within three miles of my office. Because I know that anything built within three miles of my office is old. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I know that I'm going to have to replace the plumbing from the house to the street. Every house. Tile doesn't last a hundred years. And in every house I know I'm going to have to do that. So when I'm going to make an offer on a house, I already have a really good idea of what my surprises are going to be. I like sticking in a neighborhood for that, but you need to make sure you're doing that due diligence. How much is an inspection on a house? Anybody got any idea? I hear 450, I hear 300, I pay $150. You wanna know why? I don't care that the power is on or off. All I wanna do is, is have a real inspection underneath the house and in the attic. I can eyeball everything else. I can look at the HVAC, I can have my HVAC guy go out and tell me whether or not I'm gonna to have to replace it. Everything else, I can eyeball but underneath that house and in the attic, I can't. So I don't go to the trouble of having the power turned on or the water turned on. I just want my guy to run through it, tell me what's happening underneath and above. You don't worry about the air conditioning. I, I'm sorry? You don't worry about the air conditioning. I don't worry about the air conditioning because I use my HVAC guy to tell me what's going on there. Without electric. Without electric. They'll be able to tell you. Usually, they'll be able to tell you. I haven't run into any problems yet, I should knock on wood. Um, the other thing that's really, really hard to tell is what kind of damage is going on in the walls. You're not gonna know that until you start tearing it out, right? And it's, it's that reason alone that when we underwrite a deal, we make sure that you've got extra money outside of our rehab money. Because if you've ever rehabbed a house, I promise you, you run into stuff that you didn't know was gonna be there. And, and how many people come in under budget? Just to show of hands. <laughs> Got a couple. Yeah. It's not often, is it? So you need to make sure you've got some money to handle that. Okay. When I'm buying any kind of a property, especially, especially a short-term rental or something that I think is gonna get me more rent than ever, that property, always has to stand on its own as a long-term rental because I never know, never know when the, uh, the city's gonna come down and change their mind on my short-term deal. You never know. You never know if they're gonna take that 30, 60, 90 and, and decide that that's now a short-term rental. So I always make sure that it stands alone as a rental and the number that I use for my standalone is 1.25. That's the response that I want to get back, is 1.25. I don't like the 1.1. It's a little bit too skim for me. 
So the other thing is, is I always want to make sure that in five years, my rent coming back, now this is on my Airbnb stuff, on my, five years on my rent coming back, I want to make sure that in five years, I've, I've gotten all of my capital back in my pocket. That means I've paid for the house and paid for the rehab from the rents that I'm getting. So these are some of the guidelines I use when I'm looking. Um, one of the things that I have also found is that when you are searching for property that's outside the big city, you're, you're paying less for a property. Yeah, the values aren't as high, but you're also paying less for the property. So you've got the reduced cost. The competition is a little bit better. It's just a little bit better when you're outside the city, especially if you're in a third tier city. That makes a really big difference. Um, amenities matter, matter when you're doing short-term rentals. It really does matter. And you've heard some great things coming from Alicia and you'll hear some other people talk about it too. Amenities really make a big difference. So when I'm looking at properties for myself, I wanna make sure that after I'm all in, costs and everything, that I have at least an 80% equity in my property. Did I say 80? I meant 20. 80 would be really jamming. <laughs> that would be really jamming. Okay, so let's talk finance and we're gonna stick with that right now. Credit scores matter. I know a lot of people think that they can borrow money and have a credit score that's at 600 or 580. No, you're gonna have a tough time doing that, even with a private lender, if they're smart enough to pull credit. You're gonna have a tough time doing that and you're setting yourself up to fail because there's gonna be a time when that private lender will want their money back and you're gonna have to refinance it you're not gonna get it refinanced. Not if your credit score is too low. And right now, 680 is about as low as you want it to be. So if, if you're below that credit score, it would be worth it for you to pay somebody to help you get it, not fixed, but to a point where it needs to be. Because it's not gonna happen overnight if they're trying to repair it correctly. It's not gonna happen overnight. So the other thing is, is you wanna make sure that you have cash in the bank. I love being in the mortgage business because I can ask people how much money you got in the bank and not flinch at all. And they tell me. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of nerve when I was single. <laughs> Would have helped a lot better, you know? And, and ask people what their credit score is. Wouldn't that be great if when we go out on a date, how much money you got in the bank, what's your credit score? That would solve a lot of problems. But you want to make sure you have enough money in the bank. Now, for us, when we're underwriting, is we want to make sure you have enough money in the bank to be able to, to take care of all the crap that's going to happen. And I promise you, crap is going to happen. I've said it before. You will have things happen that you just don't expect at every turn. Now, sometimes it turns out to be a good thing, like a fire and you don't have to pay for the apartment to be rebuilt, like Jim did, that was really good. That's kind of rare. That's not something that happens on a common, a common basis. However, people say, well, how much cash do I need? Well, that depends. What's the price of the house that you're investing in? What's that loan amount that you're gonna have? So for, for, for us, when we're underwriting a loan, we wanna make sure that that person is bringing 10% of the purchase price to the table. Why do we care about that? Skin in the game. We want some skin in the game. We don't want people to just, you know, bring the closing costs and run. But we also want to make sure that they have six months of payments in the bank. Why do we care about that? Because we want them to make at least the next six payments, right? We want to make sure that they have the ability to save money. Are they controlling their expenses? We don't have them come to the table with that six months, but they need to verify that they have it in the bank. That's really, really important to us. 
The next thing is we want to make sure that they have enough money if the market changes. Do you think that's ever going to happen? It will happen. It, we're, we're, in my opinion, we're sitting on a time bomb. <laughs> and if you don't think that, you're cray cray. <laughs> it is ticking every day. I've been through hell <coughs> from 2008 and then again in 2018. We've been through it. And it's really, really important that you understand that bad stuff's coming down the pike. It is, you know, we're all making hay while the sun shines. Woohoo! But it's not going to shine for much longer. Do we know what's going to happen? No. My crystal ball broke in 2008. And it has not been repaired. And I can tell you this whole time frame of what we've been going through from, oh, let's say, since about 2011 up until now, and especially since COVID hit, I would have never predicted what has happened up till this point. Would you, Jeff? Even Jeff Watson, the almighty Jeff Watson. <laughs> and that chicken nugget looks really good. <laughs> I burned so much fuel earlier, I got to I get it, I get it. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm not trying to scare you. That's not what I'm trying to do. I want to open your eyes. I want to put a little bit of fear in everything that you do. I want you to look at everything as if, as if it is a worst case scenario because it very well could be. And when you're getting ready to do some due diligence on, on a deal that you want to borrow money on or that you want to lend money on, your question needs to be, what's the worst thing that can happen and can I live through this? Will I survive? Will my family survive this? Will I get to keep my house? Not the one you're buying, but the one you live in. <clears throat> Ask yourself those questions. They're really, really important. Okay, cash in the bank. When people are, again, when people are coming to me for, if you don't have tw at least 20 to 30,000 in the bank, don't come to me, a hard money lender. Your best bet is to go to a private money lender. How many people in this room have self-directed IRAs? Raise your hand. Really high. Everybody else should be looking around really hard. This is who you need to network with. Here's your future lenders. Raise them back up. Everybody puts them down like, oh, no. <laughs> these are your lenders. Get to know these people and let them get to know you because these are the people who will loan you money, who understand what you're doing. It's really, really important. So experience. I love it when somebody calls me and says, I'm trying to do my 12th rehab and uh, it's, it's actually going to be a ground up construction, will you do the loan? Uh, yeah, all day long. Why am I jumping all over that? Because they said the word 12. That's experience. That's experience. But I can tell you, um, I love the slide that Jeff put up where he was talking about the due diligence questions that you need to ask. Every one of those questions I ask, except for who's the attorney that you use. I do that at the end of my phone call. But through my phone call, and I'm telling you, it can be five minutes or less, I know the answers to all those questions. And the reason why it's important is because you really need to know who it is you're working with. What is their experience? Who are they partnered with? That's really, really important. The one thing I'm not doing that uh, Jeff gave me a great, in fact, I already texted it to my office, is we need to start um, finding out what other entities people are involved in. That's really, really important because most people don't just have one LLC. We have 11. I'm involved in 11. And hopefully every one of them are going to make money. That's the key. So experience is really, really important. The reason why experience is important is because when things go bad, not if, when things go bad, someone who's experienced has the wherewithal to pull themselves out of it. The other thing I want is that person knows 
that in dealing with hard money or private money, that they can call me and say, hey, here's what we're facing. And I've been through a deal or two in the past 20 years. I promise you, I've seen all the crap. I've usually been involved in a lot of it. <laughs> I, I know ways of getting out of stuff. I can hook you up with people that can help you. Experience helps you get through that. So if you have no experience, then yes, I want to see that you're a member of a local RIA. Are you partnering with someone that's experienced? I've never done a deal myself, but my parents have been in real estate all my life. That's a, that's a, that's a great statement, because I know mom and dad are going to be standing there helping them. Experience is very important. Okay, we want to make sure that anybody who's in an entity, LLC, we only lend to entities, whether it's a trust, an LLC, a partnership, whatever it is, we only lend to entities. I want to make sure that everybody that, that is involved in that, that we're pulling credit on them too. Because as a hard money lender, you know, we've got this fund, but we don't keep everything in the fund. We like to take our portfolio and sell it to somebody who has a lot more money than us. And they're pulling credit on everybody in an entity. Plus, you need to know what any partner that you're dealing with, you need to know what's going on with them. You need to understand what their credit score is and you need to know if there's anything going on in their background that they may have not shared with you. Even, whether, even if it's a foreclosure, uh, forbearance, all of those, any kind of financial fraud stuff, you want to know these things. I actually, we did a loan for somebody that had three other guys in the LLC. We're still lending to them today, but one of the partners had financial fraud in their background and they didn't know until we did a credit, until we did a background check on them. They're no longer in that LLC, obviously. But you need to know these things. I mean, it was a, it was a big financial fraud piece too. So you need to know these things about who you're doing business with. Also, the numbers must work. Doesn't this seem like it would be um, simple, right? You would not believe how many people call me. So if you're going out to borrow money from a private lender, a hard money lender, a bank, I don't care who it is, but if they ask you what's the after repaired value of the house and the answer is, uh, <laughs> or the answer is, you know what, I don't know, I'm not sure. Great, call someone else. <laughs> That's the number we start off with, right? You need to make sure that they understand that these numbers work. I love it when somebody's trying to do, let's say a deal that's a $400,000 loan. And they're only gonna walk away with $20,000 in their pocket. Do you know I've had to talk people out of that? What's your time worth? People don't understand, well, I'm gonna start off with a really tiny house first. So I'm gonna buy a house where the after repaired value is $80,000. And my idea is to fix and flip it. So I know that I'm gonna get a 70% loan to value loan on this property. And if everything goes good, I'll make $11,000. Does everything go good? If the same $5,000 mistake that's made on a tiny house is the same one on a big house, it's still $5,000. That just, that just cut my $11,000 down to six. I won't let people do that, not with our company. Now they'll call somebody and somebody will give them that loan. I pity that fool. It's either that or they want the house. And I forget who it was that said this, we're not in the business, lenders, we're not in the business to build our portfolios. Did somebody say that yesterday? Tom, yeah, we're not in the, we're not in the business to build our portfolio. That's, we're lenders. We suck at this other stuff. That's why we lend. We know how to do it, we just don't like to because we're good at lending, and that, that's what we want to do. We're not interested in taking your property. 
<clears throat> but I will tell you this, everything we look at, we ask, is this a house that I want in my portfolio? Do I want to lend money to this person? We look at it as if we have to take it back tomorrow. Everybody. That's how we do our due diligence on our properties. Okay, fix and flip. Now whether you're doing short term, whether you're doing con ground up construction, whether you're doing uh, uh, a f a, the Burr thing, that I, I don't know why it got that nickname Burr thing. It's a fix and flip and hold. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> Um, hard money is a great option to go with. There's a lot of companies out there that lend hard money. There's a lot of really good ones, and they're easy to find. You Google them. If you, if you Google hard money in the state that you're doing business with, you'll come up with a great choice of people to borrow from, normally, especially the ones up at the top, because they've paid for the ads. So they usually know what they're doing. Private, hard money also have a little bit more stringent guidelines than a private money lender does. They're usually bigger. A hard money lend, lending company is a full-fledged business where many private lenders are exactly that. They may have 300000 they may have $3 million of their own money that they're lending out. They can be a little more tailored to what it is that you need, especially if you're looking at a um, a house that is unique in some way, it may be rural, um, it just may have some hair on it. Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? Yeah. But they, they may consider doing that loan, so don't forget that there's private money lenders out there. So the other option too is seller finance. My goodness, I'm shocked at the amount of people who don't ask for seller financing. That should be your second question after they've accepted your deal. That should be a question every time you talk to anybody. And when they say no, ask them why. Because a lot of people don't understand how seller financing works. They think, oh, I'm going to be a bank for 30 years and it's going to take me that long to get that money. Or um, There's going to be all kinds of things that they're going to come up with because they don't understand how it works. Guess what? If you know this much about notes, as a borrower, you can put any deal together that you have in front of you because you're being a deal architect. That's all it is. All you're doing is putting together a term that works for the person that's the seller and the person that's the buyer. That's all you're doing. Everybody's happy. I, you know, I've had people, well, I, you know, I'm not interested in seller financing. Why? Well, because I need to put my son through college. Great, how much money do you need for the first year's tuition? That's my down payment. And I make sure that every time I make a payment, it's gonna pay for that quarter's tuition. Is that solving a problem? Yeah. Absolutely it is. I gotta put my mother in a, in a assisted facility, assisted living facility. Great, how much money do you need every month for that? I'm going to find a way to make it work. I also will always, always offer people an easy out, meaning I'm going to set that term up as short as I can for them so that they know I can get it paid out in 12 months. I can get it paid out in 18 months. I can get it paid out in, in uh, two years. Whatever it is that trips their trigger, I'm going to make them think about it a little bit. You have to ask. If you don't ask, the answer is always, that's right, it's always no. So always ask that question. So here's something that I'm really excited about coming up. Do you remember the big subject two boom? Anybody remember that? Yeah, it's been a while. Guess what's coming up? The big subject two boom. If I have a prediction, I think that's what's gonna happen. Because there are a lot of people who have equity in their homes but they don't have jobs, they're not making the income that they were making, and there's no way they're gonna get caught up with their bank. There's a lot of people coming out of forbearance, there's a lot of people coming out of foreclosures that are gonna be coming up. And hopefully the hedge funds won't get to them before you do. Because there's a lot of those out there too buying ridiculous priced houses. That's our biggest competition right now, and will be for a while. 
so the way to beat them is get to the house first and then sell it to them. <laughs> Become their solution. That's a great way to tackle that. But understand that subject twos are just a great way of, for you to pick up not only long-term rent properties, but short-term rent properties. You're, you're providing a great solution. And, and there's so many different ways of doing subject two. Um, there are some states too that don't allow it anymore. So you gotta make sure that it's something you can do, right Jeff? Any, any, any states that you know that aren't doing subject twos that don't allow subject two purchases anymore? Not aware of any. There's good. Some you got to be more careful with, but they're all good to go. Awesome. I'd be really careful out on the left coast. Yeah. Is, it, is that even a part of the country anymore? <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. <clears throat> Here's what I really like too is about the equity offering and joint venturing. So, one of the things I want everybody to think about when they think of their lender whether they're a private money lender, hard money lender, whatever it is. They're your partner in your deal. They're literally partnering with you in your deal. And if you think about them as a partner, what are some other ways that we can make these deals happen? How can I get my rate lower if I really think of this person as a partner? Not really on paper a partner, but getting the return of a partner. And what I mean by that is, do you think you can negotiate a lower interest rate if you allow your lender to participate in some of the profit for a certain period of time? What? <laughs> okay, good. I'm waiting for Jeff to just shoot me down. No. The guy, the guy sitting near you is messing with me, but that's okay. It's all good. Leave him alone. <laughs> You always, always want to think about how that person that's in that deal with you can turn around and participate with you. So let's say you've got a deal, you're paying this person 5% interest rate on a term that might be three years. How are you gonna get somebody to lend you money at 5% for three years? Somebody that's um, sophisticated in lending. How are you gonna do that? You offer them an opportunity to participate in your income off of that property. I like to set it up as a quarterly payment. But you can set it up however you want to. You can, you can say, hey, I'm going to offer you 4 or 5% four or on your interest rate, but I can guarantee you at least another 5% in interest quarterly by, by allowing me to participate with you on this. You'll get a lot of people that'll jump on that. It's relaxing. How, how many people in here are actually lending money um, to people? Do you, like, do you like doing the due diligence on the properties? Do you like looking for new lenders? Do you like figuring out whether you can trust somebody or not? Wouldn't you rather have a lender that you know, like, and trust, that, or a borrower that you know, like, and trust that has been lending, borrowing money from you, paying you on time, and wouldn't you rather make that investment a little bit longer if you knew you were gonna get about the same rate off of them? Absolutely, absolutely. There is so much money out there. Do you remember how much Quest has sitting still right now? $400 million. It is harder and harder for people who are lending money to put money out on the street in a safe loan did I say safe and loan at the same time? <laughs> um, in a safe loan, <laughs> one that they won't have to keep the house, it's so hard, it's harder for us to get money out on the street to people that will treat it right because there's so much money out there and there's a lot of people lending money that have no idea what they're doing and they're gonna lose a lot of their money. So if you're lending money, think about being able to, to participate in, in something like that. So, I flipped it, didn't I? There we go. So, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about loans and terms and all the things that are out there. Talked a little bit about the non-qualifying companies that are out there now. 
Non-qualifying means, and, and we actually have a non-qualifying program for a long-term loan that it's uh, for rental properties, buy and hold, up to 20 units, and the interest rates are as low as 4%. In fact, we even got some down into the 3%. It's a 30 and 20 year mortgage. There's companies like that out there that are offering deals like that every day and they're getting better and better. See, Franny May, Fannie Mae, <laughs> I have a cousin named Franny. So, <laughs> Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Remember everybody, I'm sure everybody in here knows that they have pulled back on the investment loans that they're doing. Have you noticed that they've done that? They cut it from about 15% of their portfolio down to 75%, or I'm sorry, 0.75%. And now they're, they were talking about cutting it in half again to even less, which means they're only gonna be lending to people with absolute pristine credit on properties that are in this little tiny box that they love. So what they've done is they've made it really difficult for us investors to get out there and get long-term loans. Well, these non-qualifying companies that have buttloads of money because they've got investors that they've got to pay are now in that business. And they're, I mean, every day a new one comes across my desk. A new company comes across my desk. Non-qualifying means they are lending based on the property income based on your credit score as a borrower, and they don't even want to see your tax returns. They don't even want to see your tax returns. Wouldn't you like to do loans where you don't have to show your tax returns? Those, they want to see bank statements. They want to see your credit score. And there's a ton of them out there. All you have to do is, is Google non-qualifying lenders. There's a bunch of them out there. Yes. Mindy, is, Mindy, is she, stand up, Mindy. Yay. That's what you do, right? That's right. Yeehaw. Uh, we are owned by a huge corporation, so you check all the boxes that meet my guidelines, you qualify. We work with a lot of the private lenders in the room because there are things they don't want to do that I can absolutely do. They don't want the long term 30 year fixed rate. I'll do it all day long. So I actually partner with Chuck and a bunch of people in the room that I can help do loans that they don't want to do or they can't do. So Wendy's absolutely right. So awesome. Thank you. Awesome. And, and, and they, do you offer arms too, 5-1 arms and 7-1 arms? Are, are you doing 5-1 arms and 7-1 arms? No, I only do a 30-year. Okay, good. If somebody offers you an arm right now, that's an adjustable rate mortgage in case you don't know what it is, um, don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. The rates are as low as they're ever going to get. Don't be stupid. Take the long-term loan. That's, I don't even know why they have that. That's, that's like having written on the plastic bag, this is not a toy. <laughs> really? <laughs> don't forget too that as a borrower, you can create your own terms with a private money lender. Not all the time, not the ones that are sophisticated, but if you're dealing with a newer private money lender, you can actually create your terms with them. Sit down at the table face to face and talk about your needs, let them talk about their needs and come up with terms that work for both of you. You've got to give it a shot. You can also do the same thing, creating your own terms with equity and JV partners. I was talking to Michael about how he's gonna refinance his treehouse. How are you gonna do it? And then Michael told us yesterday he's going to go to a local bank. What are you going to do if the local bank doesn't work? He's got it in private money now. They would be the first people I'd go to. I'd see if I couldn't share some of my, my uh, profit with them and keep them in the game and lower that rate 
whatever rate he's paying, lower it down. You don't, don't forget about who you're already in business with. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some companies real quick. If you are doing short-term rental properties, Host Financial will give you the best option right now. They do loans, and I think I wrote some notes on this, let's see. Um, and then uh, uh, <laughs> Alicia was talking about, yesterday, if you go to their website and you, you get on their revenue calculator, it will tell you exactly what you should be doing in that area and what's going on in that area. It's really amazing stuff to be able to, it takes you right to AirDNA and lets you do that for free. Um, Host Financial uses the property income, they do the market rent, and they'll also do a loan based on the past 12 months. Now, if they're gonna do projected market rent, of course, you're probably gonna pay a higher rate than you would if you had a history to go there with. But they do 80% or 75% cash out on your, on your short-term rental. <clears throat> no tax returns, they don't wanna see your income, or they don't care about the income, rates are four to six and a half percent. That does not suck. That's a really good option. 30 to 45 days to close. The problem is it's a $100,000 minimum, so depending on where you are, it might not work with you. But Host Financial, in my opinion today, is number one. And the reason why I say today is because it changes every day. But Host Financial has shown the best. This is another company called Socotra Capital. I have not used them. The problem with them is they like really big towns. They want it to fit in a nice little box. They love high-end property. So you, if you are on the left coast, it's a great way to get a loan done. Um, or if you're in any kind of a high-end area, that's a great place to go. They do use property income, they do the market rent. A lot of these short-term rental loans will use market rent just like a long-term rental company will. They'll take it off of what the market rent, they don't really care about what your income really is on it, but they'll base it off of that market rent. Um, their, two, their minimum loan amount is 200,000. Cram Capital, what a great name. Uh, <laughs> really, really unusual. Um, so their minimum can be tough to hit because it's 200,000 to 300 million. So they like the really high end stuff. The rates are a little bit higher. Their credit score is 680, which really isn't bad at all. And they also base it on long term rent. Notice none of these people are asking for tax returns. Then we've got investor loan source. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Tom come in. Do you mind having Tom come in for a second? I really want you to hear about, I'm sorry? Cash. Yeah, it's Doc Cash and I forgot to change that. So his email, I mean his website is ils.cash, not, not .com. Um, here's things before he gets in here. I want you to think about, beware of your small loans. Okay, not a whole lot of lenders like small loans, a small loan is under $50,000. That's a small loan. I, we don't do them under 50,000. Well, we will, but we'll charge you like it's 50. So that's where you need to really use your private lender money. Mobile homes are really difficult to get financed. If you've got cash, mobile homes are a great cash cow. Great source of income, whether it's short term, long term, they're a great source of income, but understand, as an investor, you're gonna have a really difficult time finding a loan for it, so you're gonna need a private lender for that. Um, unique properties, yurts, the shipping containers, glamping, airstreams, log homes, um, even tiny houses, especially with the wheels on them. Not the teeny ones Lisa's talking about, the ones with wheels on them. They're, they're the most difficult to get financed. You've got to really get creative. That's why it's so important for you to have a multitude of lenders in your pocket, private lenders, people that have self-directed IRA money. And here's what's really cool. People think, well, I don't know anybody that has $300,000 in the bank. Well, you know what, that's okay. Maybe they have 100,000 in their self-directed IRA and they're spouse has 100,000 in their self-directed IRA and they might have a couple of kids that have money in their self-directed IRA. Or they may have friends and family that have money in their self-directed IRA. Preferably friends. 
and all of these people can be in first position. You write up the deed where all of these people are in first position. One person has to be in charge of really making all the decisions, <clears throat> but all of these people can be in first position. It's a really, um, I hate to use the word safe, I've done that three times now. It's a, it's a, it's a safer uh, position for people to be in when they're all in first position like that. I don't like first loans, second loans, and third loans. I don't like those. Somebody's taking a hit down the line when you do that. So I don't like them, people do them. Um, so when you're doing stuff that's funky, just understand your local bank is a good choice, but I doubt you're gonna get anywhere. The private lenders are the way to go. So the other thing is square foot does matter, especially when you're doing a conventional loan, the square footage of the property. There's a lot of companies that won't go below 1,000 or go below 900. So you need to be careful. Make sure you source people that do care about the square footage. The reason why I'm throwing these at you is because these are questions that you need to ask the people that you're talking to about your borrowing. When you're borrowing money, these are all questions you need to ask them because a mortgage broker will say, oh yeah, we do log homes all the time. Oh yeah, I can do a small house for you. They don't know. You need to ask them specifically to find out those answers for you because you'll get bad information, you'll close on a house and then you're stuck. Make sure you're working with somebody that really understands what they're doing. The other thing that you really need to be careful about is being in a flood zone. Has anybody in here owned property where they had to pay flood insurance on the property? It sucks. It's, it, it's really, it's hard. I mean, you're, you can completely change a deal if you're paying $4,500 a month in flood insurance. Uh, not a month, a year. A month would really be bad. <laughs> But you're completely changing your deal. So make sure you look at that. And you know, another thing that I really loved about Jeff's video or Jeff's slides when he was talking about the due diligence that you use, um, you're wondering what's the history on the neighborhood, the school system, um, you know, just what's been going on with that deal. There's one thing you can do where you can get all of that information. Anybody know what that is? It's called an appraisal. <laughs> it's pretty simple to get one. Just call Corey right That's right. And, and, and I'm sure Corey will back me up. Now, when people open up an appraisal, the first thing they do is they look at the price, right? If it's a price you like, then it was good. If it's a price you didn't like, then it was awful. But did you know that there's other things in an appraisal that can tell you whether or not this is a good deal, even if the numbers work. Appraisals tell you everything about a house. Is it on a septic? Is it on a well? Um, is it on a dirt road? Uh, what's been going on in the neighborhood buy and sell wise? If you've got a house on a dirt road and you're trying to get a conventional loan on it, did you know that you have to have a third party contractor that everybody's agreed to that's actually taking care of that road on a regular basis or they won't do the loan? Did you know that if you have a shared well with other people that own other property around you and you don't have a third party company with an easement to be able to get to the well from everybody that you can't close on that property? Did you know that if your heat source in your house is different from all the other comps that are on your appraisal, that that lender's gonna have a problem with it? It's, it's little stuff that you don't realize you really need to understand how that works. You, lenders have a problem with things. They wanna make sure that when I take this house back, I can sell it just like this. So they're gonna pick it apart. Make, you know how much an appraisal is? We're getting them between 350 and 550 for just about every property we're doing. It's the best insurance policy you can get other than insurance. <laughs> so make sure you get an appraisal. So easy to do. <clears throat> Flood zones, we talked about that. Off-grid houses, 
they're kind of new. If I'm running an appraisal, I'm looking for other off-grid houses. You think I'm going to have a whole bunch of them within three miles? Probably not. Be careful about that. Extreme rural is really tough to get a loan for. So these unusual properties, you have to have private money lenders. And there's a ton of money out there, folks. And you know how I found my private money lenders? So anytime somebody asks me, well, what do you do for a living? I help people build wealth. I don't say another word. Really, how do you do that? And then I tell them a little bit about what I do as a lender and how I can, I'm sorry? How much would you say you've raised? Oh, well, we have $23 million of self-directed IRA money. That's not in the fund. That's not in the fund. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, and then we have the fund on top of that. So it's, it's so, it's so easy. You just have to ask and don't be ashamed to ask. Don't be, we were raised our whole lives to not ask people how much money they make or how much money they have in the bank, weren't we? It's something that, that you know, it's taboo. You're not supposed to ask. How are you going to know if you don't ask? Well, the way in is to get them to ask you questions first. What do you do for a living? I help people build wealth. Really, how do you do that? your door is open to start telling them what you do. Okay, so like I said, loans are getting better daily. One of the things that I do is um, I've had so many people, I've been doing this over 20 years, I've had so many people just open the door and give me an opportunity to do what I do and teach me what I do. And you know, it started out with Larry Goins giving me an opportunity to even speak in front of people. He was the first one that allowed me to get up and speak in front of people. Um, people have shared so much information with me. I want to be able to give back. And um, I l would love to talk to everybody that wants to talk. But if I you know, went and had coffee and had lunch, I'd weigh way more than I do today. Um, and I just don't have time. <laughs> so I give my Wednesdays up. It's called Wednesdays with Wendy. I tithe my Wednesdays to, to setting up. I've got a uh, four hour period every 30 minutes that I'll speak with people and, and help you. I can, I'm a member of a whole bunch of mastermind groups and I've, I've been blessed to meet the coolest people in the world that are in this business and I can hook you up with people that can help you if I can. And I'm happy to do it. So this uh, address right here, if you'll get on there, you can book a time with me. Um, and I'll spend 30 minutes with you, and I've got people who, I've got people who book a 30-minute uh, Wednesday with me every month. It's free, of course. <laughs> you, don't, you don't give stuff away and charge for it. But I'm happy to help you anytime you want. I also want to make sure that I mention to you, too, and uh, Jim talked about it earlier today. Every Friday for the past 19 years, um, uh, faith-based investors have been meeting for breakfast at 7.30 every Friday morning. Many of the people in this room have been speakers. Um, it is killer. So we started off with a 10 minute devotional and then we just let her rip about real estate. Our goal is to only, is for it to be an hour, but many times it goes over. Um, there are many people in this room and they're laughing. <laughs> we just let it go. And, and we talk about real estate. I mean, it's just, it's amazing what you can learn, the connections that you can make. Sometimes it ends up being just a Jesus meeting. So be prepared for that. <laughs> and that's good too. But I would love to have you, you come and join us. It's free. Uh, we're doing it on Zoom now because COVID you know, took care of that for us. Um, and I will have it posted on Jim's um, investor Facebook page this evening for tomorrow morning. You're more than welcome to join anytime. We'd love to have you. Anytime you have questions, I'm happy to, to answer any that you have. I also want to plug our booth back there at the back. We are giving away a $50 Lowe's gift certificate. So if you'll put your name in our little bucket back there, um, I, you could be the winner. You can't win if you don't try, right? Just like the lottery, not quite as good, but just like it. 
Thank you so very, <laughs> yeah. thank you so very much. I've really enjoyed it.